Oh, hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome to, as the American Space Museum presents another edition of Stay Curious. I'm Mark Marquette, and so glad you're here with me catching me playing with dolls here. This is a Buzz Aldrin G.I. Joe doll. And we wanted to start out the show a little bit by thanking a wonderful contributor to our museum, John Patterson. John called us up not too long ago and said, I'm moving. I've got a bunch of things I want to donate to the museum. And look in front of me here is some very G.I. Joe astronauts from the period I grew up in in the 60s. Action dolls, uh, action figures. Jessica Galloway's doing the uh, controls behind the scenes there. As uh, We're missing Marty today. He's got some personal things to take care of. Uh, but... Uh, Yes, uh, back in the 60s, these were a big deal, and uh, though uh, now they're called action figures back then, as a young boy, I didn't know really what to think of them, but my parents never got me an Apollo one or a Gemini one or a space shuttle one here, and uh, so I'm playing with these for a minute, thanking John Patterson and reminding you that if you have space memorabilia that you want to part with two ways, that happens is you can donate it outright and we will analyze it uh, through our process uh, or uh, you can consign it to us and we give you a good percentage of the sale on things in here. Look at this gorgeous Mercury model there with an, another astronaut in it. And John Patterson had several of these. We're so grateful that he wanted to part with them. And, uh, and uh, he said he's a pretty well-heeled individual. So... Here's a couple of the other ones. You can make that bigger behind me there. Uh, a whole plethora there of some cool space stuff here, action models. Uh, and uh, this one is actually Bob Crippen. And this one is um, Buzz Aldrin. It actually looks like Buzz. Those are pretty dang accurate. And these are very accurate, uh, Jessica. They have pouches on them uh, for the, the moon uh, walk. This one's even got a little walkie-talkie that they never yeah, used in the pocket the there but uh, this is so important to keeping our nonprofit open as people donating things or consigning us to them number one we are a nonprofit needing the money and we're very fair about this and when you give us this we're going to make all the money on these when we put these in an auction but we might keep a couple of these uh, for the display that's up to our executive director karen conklin and our nick enix our auction our, our uh, collections manager to decide and then things go to our auction coordinator chuck jeffrey 30 years in the memorabilia business he authenticates everything and then uh it either goes to auction or goes to ebay things under a hundred dollars we sell on ebay so we do have an ebay presence at american space museum and the auction next auction will be december 4th so i don't think these items will be in there maybe in our auction in uh, february because we're having about every other month but so fun to play with these dolls here i mean these action figures okay and once again thank you john patterson for thinking of our museum uh when you give us things we certainly give you a tax uh, form for your deduction tax deductible giving and uh we'll be looking up the value of these things and sending that off to john patterson by the way he just lived five miles from our museum you just never know what treasures are going to show up here at the American Space Museum. I'm so blessed to be part of this because every day is like Christmas. People bring in a boxes all the time and say, you know, mom passed away, dad passed away. They were contractors at KSC or Cape Canaveral. We don't know what's in here. And we'll be honest with you and go through it and tell you, hey, there's some money in here. And this is worth a little bit of money. And this is worth some. And if you want to consign it, fine. Uh, and we usually give you over 70% on the dollar on consignment. You work out your own deal with that. So little plug for what we do here and letting Mark play with toys for the, uh, uh, the first time in a long time. But these are the kinds of toys that big, uh, big boys like me love. So but we got some space history for you today. As you know, for 20 years, we've been preserving the birth of the American Space Age. Two wonderful missions happen today in space history or we're going on on november 9th and the first one we're going to kick off with oh, nope i'm sorry we got the birthday here uh happy birthday to belated birthday he was born yesterday november 8th to ed gibson turned 84 born in buffalo new york ed gibson happy birthday he is a great supporter of the american space museum 
he and his wife retired on the Space Coast many years ago, and he's been involved in lots of uh, promotions throughout the years, particularly raising money for the shuttle monument at Space View Park, one of our crown jewels here in downtown Titusville. Uh, and uh, we hope you come and visit it And Saturday's launch at 9.03 uh, p.m. We'll talk about that in a minute, but go out to Space View Park and meet our rocket hobo, Ozzy Osbourne, who is here, Osband, I mean, Ozzy Osband. He was here last week, gave us a little insight of of how he created, he was responsible for the 321 area code here. Definitely but Ed Gibson, watch yeah, definitely watch a re rewatch with Ozzy, as are all of our programs on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And please watch that YouTube channel. We're trying to get our hours up, and you can watch them, and they'll roll into other Stay Curious programs. Put it on mute if you're tired of listening to me. But turn it up when when the uh, turn it up when Triple T's here, and uh, uh, Bart is also hosting uh, some things. So, uh, but Ed Gibson, thank you for all you've done for the American Space Museum. He was the science uh, pilot, science officer, if you will, of Skylab Four, which was launched on December sixteenth, nineteen seventy four. It was an eighty four day mission, the longest space flight in history up to that time. And uh, we'd love to get Ed on our program here and talk about that someday. Well, next up, we've got the crew. <coughs> excuse me. The crew. I hit three, and that didn't make it bigger. Am I doing wrong? You're going back to four. Oh, I go back to four. What yeah. is this, my friends? This is a photograph taken with an iPhone 6 of crew two coming back over the florida coast this is from from pensacola they landed off the of pensacola uh last night 10 30 at night beautiful infrared images of the the uh, parachutes coming down dr j wayne wooten of pensacola shared this on spaceweather.com one of my favorite sites he said that the brightness rivaled jupiter uh, and that he got a sequence of 30-second exposures with his iPhone 6, Jessica. I mean, uh, that I mean, I just can't believe it. One, that he could hold it steady that long. He must have had it propped up on something. But um, uh, this was just before the parachutes deployed, he said, seconds later. Uh, a show to save her for a lifetime. And Dr. Wayne Wooten, thank you for sharing that on spaceweather.com. Uh, and uh, but what we want to talk about today, one of two wonderful days in space history today, by the way, the photograph. Look at this gorgeous earth behind me, Jessica. This were so, so uh, uh, jaded, not jaded, but so used to seeing gorgeous pictures like this. But this was one of the first times we'd seen this on high tech film. It was very good uh, film orbited or, or suborbited on the Apollo Four launch, the first all-up Saturn V launch. They took over 700 pictures of the Earth, and I wanted to display one of these to show our gorgeous globe here. Uh, the blue, thin blue line is the only border we should be thinking about. Uh, and just a stunning photo uh, of this. Let me put up our pictures of the first launch at Kennedy Space Center on November uh, 9th, 1967. The first launch at Kennedy Space Center, that's correct. They've been launching at Cape Canaveral since Kennedy Space Center was built, specifically as our moon port. This is pad 39A, the first time they used it. There was no B at the time of this on November 9th, 1967. Uh, just two years before Apollo 12 was going to land on the moon in, uh, in 1967 and double down on President Kennedy's pledge to go to the moon before the end of the decade. But this was the first time, and what an unknown, what what had became a routine sight was an incredible unknown 54 years ago when a 6 million pound rocket slowly lifted off Kennedy Space Center at 7 a.m. November 9, 1967 to an awestruck throng of NASA engineers as well as an inquisitive public lining the beaches, the roads, and the causeways. I believe on this one, the CBS television news crew along with abc and nbc were caught off guard they built up these little shacks if you will to broadcast the the launches uh three and a half miles away at the press site beside the big vab and famously walter cronkite on cbs stands up to hold the windows he thought we're going to come in it was rattling so much and the, the ground 
shaking was so unbelievable. Even over here in Titusville, 10 miles away, buildings shook a little bit and, 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 and windows rattled. Uh, first time. And you know what? We had 13 successful launches of a mighty Saturn V. No significant failures. All of them did what they were supposed to do. A few of them had a few hiccups along the way, but they still made the mission. Isn't that incredible? Werner von Braun's masterpiece, the Saturn V rocket, still the most powerful rocket ever built until we launched the Space Launch System, of course, next year. But 13 for 13, all right? And uh, just an, uh, you just can't underestimate that in in the uh, rocket engineer technology that all of these uh, Saturn Vs went off without a hitch. Um, it, this was the test of the Apollo Command Module heat shield in the first high-quality photographic films of the Earth's globe were achieved here, uh, like another one right there. Uh, this was called AS-501, and it had a block uh, one command module uh, and a service module attached to it, and it had kind of a dummy lunar module article in, in there underneath the slaw that's, that's behind the uh, Apollo uh, uh, service module. And uh, first use of, a, of Complex 39, the spacecraft landed eight hours and 37 minutes later in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, the main objective is to demonstrate the structural and thermal integrity of the Saturn V rocket, as well as the, the Apollo command module and the heat shield. At re-entry, lunar return conditions were accomplished. They went out about 30,000 miles and did a U-turn and came back with the heat shield on that. This uh, module, by the way, there is the Apollo 4 command module, a very famous piece of, of, of American space history, no doubt. This is at the Infinity Museum, Jessica, which is on the Mississippi-Louisiana border on Interstate 10. Road trip. Road trip. I've been there twice. Our One of our wonderful benefactors, uh, Fred Hayes, the Apollo 13 Fred Hayes, and, of course, the uh, approach and landing test pilot for our shuttle. Um, would have gone on a shuttle trip, uh, to, uh, but uh, 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 he just – uh, things were going too slow for him at the time, and Fred become a, a vice president Grumman. Gr Fred Hayes knew the lunar module better than anybody else, and so fortunate he was on Apollo 13 because his insight helped save those astronauts. And we love Fred Hayes. I believe he's 86. He's best friends with our CEO and board chairman Charlie Mars, and uh, we wish uh, Fred Hayes well. He's a uh, he's on Facebook occasionally. You'll see one of his granddaughters cutting his hair with some dog shears during the uh, midst of the COVID days. And we have had a wonderful interview with Fred Hayes, our first astronaut we interviewed via Zoom. Go check that out. I believe it was back July, around July 4th, because uh, I remember I had the flags out for him in the 2020. So space history also today, one of the most phenomenal missions ever of any shuttle mission. This is what the shuttle was devised for 37 years ago. STS-51A was launched on November 8th. So today, 37 years ago, they released a TELSAT satellite uh, into or geosynchronous orbit. The third day of their eight-day mission, they released a Defense Department satellite known as LeSat. And then two of the astronauts, and I'll explain the astronauts here in just a minute, did a spacewalk on, on uh, the manned maneuvering units, untethered, and went out and retrieved two satellites that were in errant orbits. When the shuttle deployed a satellite like it did the TELSAT H on this, they had what they call a PAM, a payload assist module, was a solid rocket on the bottom, and they'd deploy it into space, 17,500 miles an hour, of course, 250 miles up. But to get to the parking orbit they wanted with that satellite, and when they got far enough away from it, the ground would automate, who owned the satellite, would trigger the PAM, uh, and the solid rocket would boost it up to its proper orbit, geosynchronous orbits, 22,000 miles. Uh, well, this is the early days of, of the shuttle, okay? In fact, uh, in, um, uh, so a couple of those PAMs didn't work out right, and two of them failed. And these astronauts went up to get that. And let me consult the scroll here. My subtle scroll here says that this was the second flight of Discovery, 
1984, and they were up there eight days, okay, in the pad 39. Now, the 51A, what's that all about? Well, they were called STS 1 through 9, and then the 10th one become 41B. What that is all about is the 50, 51, 5 stands for 1985 fiscal year, which goes from October to October. The 1 stands for launch from Kennedy Space Center. 2 is going to be Vandenberg, all right, which we never launched from there. It was going to be our Department of Defense, and Discovery was going to be uh, uh, permanently there at Vandenberg in California. And the A, B, C, D basically is A, B, C. Uh, what it was not the sequence they launched, but the sequence they chose the mission there. So I want to talk about these astronauts real quick before the mission. Sitting down there to the right of our of, of the uh, Hawk, which I'll bet they're smiling because it's probably a stuffed Hawk, Hawk, uh, Eagle, American Eagle there. Um, uh, wish they have the Eagle emblazoned on their mission patch. That is Rick Hauk. Okay, he's now 80, born in Long Beach, California. This is the second of his three missions. He was a pilot and then a commander on this one. And then he commanded the return to space after Challenger on STS-26. After 51L, which was the 25th launch, and the uh, 14th in that sequence of, of, of numbering, okay, they went, uh, no, from 9 to 25 is what, uh, uh, 16th. Uh, in that sequence, uh, they went back to just the straight numbers. So 26, Rick uh, commanded that. He's 80 years old. Uh, standing up to him, uh, to, le to the left there of the eagle, is David Walker, born in Columbus, Georgia, twice a pilot, twice a commander. And he unfortunately died at age 56 in 2001. Anna Fisher is the lady there. She's 72 now. Born in Queens, New York. This was her only flight. She was married to astronaut Bill Fisher. They had a daughter. She was the first mother to fly in space uh, on this mission. Uh, and born in Queens, New York, like I said. She was the remote manipulator arm system uh, that was so important on this mission. Uh, Dale Gardner is uh, there on the top left. Uh, and he's from Fremont, uh, Fairmont, Minnesota. He had two flights, STS-8. Uh, with the first African-American, Guy Bluford. And he died in 2014 at age 65 of a stroke. So we have two astronauts passed away of this crew of five. And Joseph Allen is on the right there. Happy Joe Allen. Uh, boy, he's a friendly astronaut. Great to, to see him at things. He was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana. He's the oldest of this crew survivors. He's 84. This was his last of two space flights. And he wrote one of the best first books about the shuttle era. Everybody owns it, Entering Space and Astronaut's Odyssey. And he it was all about his spacewalks and so forth. So uh, now what these guys did was Alan and Gardner did two spacewalks, and there they are going out to their, uh, uh, and I believe uh, this is a photograph taken by Tom Usiak. Thank you, Tom, for all the photos you and your brother Mark supply us. Um but look at this incredible image, Jessica. Is this crazy or what? There is the Palapa satellite that didn't go to orbit, stranded in orbit. Uh, Discovery went over next to it about 200 yards away to keep the thrusters and so forth, debris from hitting it. And then uh, 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 Allen, Joseph Allen, uh, on the MMU, Man Maneuvering Unit, untethered, all right, just him in the world on a spacesuit in his own private spaceship, uh, taxi going out there, and they called that the, uh, oh, what'd they call that? I wrote it down, the, um, uh, oh, the uh, catcher there. They, they, I, I forget the name they use for that. Somebody will come up with that. The Not the prong. The, uh, oh, I wish I'd wrote that down. Anyway, the Palapa B-2 and West Star Satellite were both retrieved, grappling them uh, with uh, these uh, jet-propelled maneuvering packs and a special grappling fixture there, all right? Then they brought them into the main deck of the shuttle. Oh, there's the launch, yep, uh, and that's a, a Tom Usiak picture of the launch. Then they brought them in and stuck them in there, and they put a head of for sale sign back there. And they called themselves the uh, 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 Ace Repo Company, okay? 
And let me go back real quick to the launch of the guys here. No spacesuits, folks. They just wore like, all right, we're going to choose these blue dungarees to wear to space, okay? And uh, so from the uh, first uh, STS-5, after the first four test flights, uh, STS-5 on, they just wore these blue flight suits up to 50, 51L. Uh, very comfortable. They had a helmet on, of course. It was more like a motorcycle helmet, so they wouldn't bang their head on stuff. But I always like pointing that out because then we went to the orange pumpkin suits after the Challenger accident. But, man, just look at that picture. Think of that. I mean, holy cow, I, I, I probably couldn't do it. I would just freak out completely. But many of you out there would love to do that. And there's our thin blue line up there, folks. The only thing that separates us from death and destruction in outer space. There's the beautiful launch of Discovery, second time she returned to space. There is Garner and Allen with their for sale sign up there on the robotic arm. And Gardner had another close up there of there because they brought these back and then they were fixed and taken to space again. And this is the space truck that the space transportation system was envisioned to be when it was first uh, devised in the 1970s. In fact, Apollo 16 was on the surface of the moon and John Young and Charlie Duke were told that Congress just approved the money for the space shuttle. And, and, and not knowing that he would ride the first space shuttle, John Young said, that's great, our country needs it. And what an asset it was for our country. And, and it is sad that, they, that we don't have one or two of them still in our stables because when the program ended after 30 years in 2011, they were never flying cleaner or, or doing more uh, with these space shuttles, coming back uh, beautiful shape and going up all the time. And all of our shuttle workers that we've had on our program emphasize that. But uh, it was a wonderful era. And I just wanted a couple comments, Jessica, that we get from time to time from our friends on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Tom Celentano is a Stay Curious uh, watcher, and he posted on our uh, post yesterday of the STS-51A, Tom said, I remember it well. When I got to work after liftoff, a co-worker said she had, quote, watched the Sputnik go up that morning. <laughs> and, you know, Tom, I'll stand behind at a Cumberland or something uh, gas station after a launch, and they'll say, well, did you see that shuttle go up yesterday, you know? And, of course, it was a SpaceX or, or United Launch Alliance like thing in there. And, you, hey, as long as people are looking up and interested in it, I don't care what they call it. And then we had another comment, Jessica, from Bob Adamczyk. And Bob Adamczyk says, Discovery's greatest mission from her golden age. And what do you all think about that? Make a comment about that. This was certainly what we wanted the space truck to be about, taking up uh, satellites for money, then bringing back those back that were going to be up there. Experiments were done and bring them back to Earth. Uh, like the like the long duration uh, experiment with had all the paints and different fabrics and and metals on it, um, and uh, or or uh, uh, retrieve satellites and things up there. But after the Challenger disaster, it was revealed that this was more complicated than we thought. They had a bunch of close calls that they kind of swept under the rug, and of course the rest is history. It become well all of the, all of the. Uh, 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 Defense Department, except for a few, and a lot of the other commercial companies went to the single-stick rockets that were going to be extinct because of our space transportation system. Finally, a wonderful comment from Peggy Boswell Honeycutt of Cocoa Beach. Peggy says, great crew, with an exclamation point. And she ought to know because her husband, Jay Honeycutt, was the uh, he served on several key positions of flight operations until 1988. So he, she, he must have had something to do with this crew for Peggy to Honeycut to mention about that. Thank you for watching, Kenny or Peggy, and say hi to uh, Jay Forrest. He was the Kennedy Space Center uh, director from 1995 to 1997. And we have a wonderful interview conversation with Jay Honeycutt in our archives. So we love talking about our friends out there in space uh, uh, and stay curious that love space. So thank you all for your comments on there. And there's my picture there. Thought I had, thought I was going out with something else there. Let's see. Did we get... Uh, I guess we don't. Maybe I have, I think I have two pictures at the end 
um or no maybe those maybe that was the uh space uh x uh shot there but uh we've gone through all them pictures here on our fun little program and hope that you've all enjoyed it yep uh Let me take out no no that's okay that's okay uh there was a meteor streak in there and that's okay i just wanted to remind you all that this is the week of a beautiful moon dance across our skies as the moon is going from first quarter thursday night to full phase it'll be near jupiter it's near saturn tonight and it'll be near Jupiter tomorrow night. So get out and get a little moonshine on your face. That's the kind of moonshine you can't get too much of. And come back tomorrow. Well, there, there's there's the landing that Tom Usiak took of uh, of uh, uh, discovery. Okay, good. That's good. That's good. But yeah, we're all we're so glad that you joined us today. Our nonprofit uh, really appreciates all uh, that everyone does for us. Here's my little Mercury astronaut I'm going to play with. This one is so cool because it's got the the concave uh, mirror on the chest that the astronauts wore so they could see. So the movie camera that was taking pictures of them in the Mercury capsule could see where the toggle switches were in case there was an accident involved in there. So uh, thank you again, John Patterson, for donating the things you did to our American Space Museum. You people out there know people that have space stuff and want some money for it, uh, we do it through our auction. We don't pay you outright for anything. Uh, or you want to donate it. And there's a lot of you in the St. Louis area where McDonald was that built the Mercury and Gemini that have a lot of space memorabilia. And we get, we've had people ship it to us and sell it and make a lot of money. So I'm going to go ahead and play with my dolls here. I mean, excuse me, action figures. Well, tomorrow we have got uh, a what. A wonderful conversation with Dr. Al Kohler tomorrow. Dr. Al Kohler, wonderful mentor of mine here at the museum. He is a Titusville native and a mover and shaker for 50 years in this community. He was a NASA in management for some 30 years and then involved with the local Brevard uh, Community College. And then he founded Space Tech that... Uh, um, certifies uh, aviation and space workers. So uh, you're not going to want to miss that tomorrow. Great conversation with a great friend and a wonderful man, Al, Dr. Al Kohler. So until then, I'm Mark Marquette playing with my action figures here until tomorrow when we will bridge the space between us. So what do you think there, Buzz? You ready to go up in space again?